they say it was good to have come to the house of the Lord. I pray that you'll touch your service today. Give me out of myself. Fill me with your spirit. Allow me to preach and search for riches of God in a manner that will be pleasing to you. I pray that I'll be that safe to communicate with the gospel that I originally desire to be. And we're going to be very careful to give y'all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious and holy name we do pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 <coughs> we'll look at this passage of scripture. Chris, read the passage of scriptures. Scripture, the son. To all of you may not have heard this passage of scripture. Let me kind of introduce the characters really quickly to you. Uh, a few characters in this story. We need to key in on. At first, we're going to look at a man by the name of Elkanah. And as we begin to look at him, we know that a little bit about him. The, Samuel, the, the writer of Samuel don't give us a whole lot of information about him. We do know that he was an Ephraimite from the tribe of Ephraim. Uh, he had two wives, Hannah and Paniah. Now, polygamy was a big thing in that culture. It was not uncommon for a man to have two wives. If a lot of kings had wives, concubines. It was not uncommon at all in that culture. Um, it was disclosed in Scripture for the sake of making a point. It was not necessarily promoted or praised in Scripture, but uh, it was very common in that culture. So as we begin to see this, he had <coughs> he had two wives, and El Elkanah had these two ladies that were, that were both wives to him. And, and most likely these wives lived in, in different places because as we begin to read this passage of Scripture, and everything that I can read, we begin to see that they didn't ever meet up but a couple times, or one time a year when it was on the day of the Jonah, when they would come and, and offer sacrifices to the Lord. Um, it was not like a king in a royal setting where the, the wives all lived in one castle or one home there and one mansion or whatever. But they lived in, in a couple different places, and, and Elkanah was, was going back into between these two wives. And if we see that, we can see that each year that they would come to the to the sacrifice of the Lord on the Day of Atonement. It was a custom that they would come there. They would bring a sacrifice before the high priest and he was the mediator between them and God. And he would offer this sacrifice uh, before them or on, on their behalf. And it was a family of men. The whole family would go and they would participate in this. And there was a meal that was involved and, and there was some festivities and some things that went along with this. And this particular year, the, the tabernacle was at Shiloh. They, they came from their hometown around Eli is the high priest. He was the one, the mediator. And as we get into verse 3, it was kind of interesting there how the writer brought this out. And it says, um, it says in verse 3, the man went up out of the city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh and his two sons, uh, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priest of the Lord, were there. Now, as we begin to understand this, we begin to know that Eli was the high priest. He was the mediator. He was the one that accepted the sacrifice. He was the one that carried out the priestly duties. He was the, the stand between, the go-between, between the people and God. And as we begin to see this, why does the writer, why, why is he so explicit on putting this information in there that these two sons were there? I, I, think, he, uh, <clears throat> I think he really was very intentional when he put that there. I think he wanted us to know that they were there. But as we begin to read a little further into this, we find out that these two boys were corrupt. We know that. We preached this a couple of weeks ago. We know that they died in battle. We know that the Philistines came against them. They were killed in battle. We know that they took the Ark of the Covenant. We know that, <clears throat> that uh, Eli was sitting in the gate of the city when he heard the news. He fell over and broke his neck. We know that the daughter-in-law was the daughter-in-law was pregnant and had a son and they, they called <coughs> called talking to Ichabod. We know that and we begin to see that Israel is on the downhill spiral here. We begin to see that, that there's some corruption there. Eli has turned the, the priestly duty, so to speak, over to these two boys and I think that was one thing that, that the writer wanted us to, to be able to understand there and to communicate to us. But as we begin to see that, the writer's very intentional when he puts this information in there when he inserted that into there. And I think he wanted us to know that. But we see that the, 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 the corruption, it seems like it goes, seems like it goes unnoticed by God. And as we begin to see this, it's like everybody knew this. Elkin knew that there was corruption there. He knew that these boys were not what they needed to be. They were not living the life that they needed to be. They were not, they were certainly not significant of what the priests of Israel were to look like and how they were conduct themselves and carry themselves out. They were certainly not that. He knew that. 
But he knew that his sacrifice was not to them. He knew that his sacrifice was to the Lord. He was not sacrificing to them. He knew that there was a higher power. He knew that, that Eli was the mediator between him and God. And he knew that this sacrifice was his worship. And he knew that the worship that he brought before that tabernacle there was not to Eli or not to Hophni or Phineas, but it was to the Lord. And he knew that. So as he understood that, that was his way of saying, even though that they're corrupt, even though the things are not like they should be. Uh, that's not going to hinder me from serving God. And I think as we begin to look at that in the world that we live in today, it will be real easy for us to say that we live in a tainted world. It will be real easy for us to say that we live in a world that, that, that things are just corrupt, that things are, are bad. And you know, that God's really just not paying attention to what's going on. But that's not the case. It was not the case in the days of Elkanah. It was not the case in the days when Eli was the priest there. It was, it was not that God was not paying attention. But as we begin to see this, it would be real easy for us to look at the world we live in and say there's no need to continue to go to church. There's no need to continue to worship God. It just seems like God is not paying attention. But we look at this passage of Scripture and we begin to see that God is very aware of what's going on. So much aware that as we read into this story and continue on, if we, I don't have time to preach it this morning, but if we continue on into this story, we see that through what we're going to read today, God is raising up a priest. God is raising up someone to change the tide. There's no turnaround for the nation of Israel. Now, as we begin to look at this, I see a, a, if we read through this passage of Scripture, we see a turnaround in Hannah's life. Well, not only in Hannah's life do we see a turnaround, if we read all the way through this book of the Bible, we'll see a turnaround in the nation of Israel. Now, to put all this into perspective, I don't have time to get into the, the nation of Israel's turnaround. Well, let's look at Hannah and we can kind of get back, back to her for there just a minute. We know that there was, <clears throat> that there was two women. The Bible says that, that uh, <clears throat> there was Benai and she had children. Hannah did not. Now, that sounds like on the surface that the writer's just stating some facts there. You know, as we read that, I'm going to read it in verse 2. And it says, he had two wives, one of them was Hannah, the other was Benaiah. Benaiah had children, but Hannah had no children. I mean, that's just kind of stating the fact. As we look at that, I, I think that, that we can really gloss right over that pretty easily and say, okay, we, we get that, we understand that. But I think there's more to that in all actuality. I think that it's not just declaring facts, it's not just stating facts, but it's declaring a dilemma. It's a dilemma that's in this in uh, Hannah's life. And in that culture, as we begin to understand that, you, you know, there's a lot of things that are terrible for people in our culture, but in that culture, it was really terrible. It was it was it was a disgrace to the women of that day that were buried, that could not have children. It was almost like a curse to them. And Hannah was struggling with this. And they go off to Shiloh to offer sacrifice. This is where the, 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 the tabernacle was set up this year. The whole family's there. And, and, and you know it was hard for him. And you know that this is, was a trip that they had been planning for, <clears throat> for many months. They knew that it was coming. And they had been planning this trip. And Hannah was probably dreading this trip. She was probably in a point in her life where she said, you know, I really don't want to go, but I'm, I'm required to go. It's a family thing. And, you know, she knew that the night was going to be there. She knew that all her sons and daughters would be there. We read on down in Scripture. We, we find that. And it was one thing for her to know that, that they were going to be there. It was another thing for her to know that she didn't have children. The truth of the matter was it was a, it was a hard thing. But when she gets there, we find out that it, the Bible says that her adversary would provoke her. As we begin to read that in verse 6, and then we'll go back up in just a moment. But it said her adversary provoked her sore to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. So when Hannah gets there, here comes Benaiah, parading in with all her children, walking over all her children, making, you know, how, how much she loved her children, how well her children were doing. You know, she was just pouring it on thick. And here was poor Hannah over here standing in the corner with nothing. Felt so, so unworthy. Felt so unloved. Felt so out of place. And here she was. She was just in a, in, in a bad place. And this didn't just happen one time. This was some of verse 7 as we read it there. It says that this went on year after year after year. So let's just be real for a minute. You think about Hannah. You think about what's going on. And I think as we kind of convey this into our lives, and we kind of bring this into reality in our lives, there's times in our life 
when we are in situations much like this. We are in situations where we feel so insecure. We feel like we are really just don't want to be there. And that's when the, we go through a hard time, we go through a trying time, we go through a struggle, and you just don't want to be around people. And then all of a sudden, here comes the enemy, the adversary, so to speak. And he begins to, to poke us. And he begins to aggravate us, especially when we're going through a hard time. And, and, I, and I think he, he begins to say things that will discredit us. The Bible says that the enemy or, the, or Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And that's exactly what he wants to do. He wants to accuse us of being unworthy. He wants us to accuse us of being insignificant in the eyes of God, insignificant in the kingdom of God. Maybe he wants to tell us things that we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, we're not spiritual enough. Well, you know, you just kind of fill in the blank there. And I think we all have faced some of this from time to time. We come to a place in the time in our life where we feel that insignificance. We feel that unworthiness. We look around and we kind of we kind of settle to the back and we kind of look to ourselves and say, you know, I, I'm not as good. I'm not as good as this one, or I'm not as smart as this one, or I'm not this, or I'm not that. And we just kind of, we just kind of, the, the open-ended thing, we just kind of go on and on and on. And then the enemy comes along there, and he kind of, he, he kind of reassures us, oh yeah, you're not. You're not as smart, or you're not as good, or you're not this, or you're not that. He is the accuser of the brother. And we see that, <clears throat> he even goes as far as telling us sometimes that, that God doesn't love us, because He'll say things like, if God really loves you, you wouldn't be where you're at. If God really loves you, you wouldn't be in this position. If God really loves you, he would get you out of this situation. If God really loves you, now he would give you a child. If God really loves you, he would help you get past your, your situation, your circumstances. He would help you if God really loves you. That is a lie from the pits of hell. That is a lie from the accuser of the brother. That is a liar from the, the chief of all liars. That is a liar from Satan. So this is where Satan, this is where hell is at. She feels unworthy. She feels unloved. She feels insecure. She feels unwanted. And then all of a sudden, here comes the adversary. Here comes the knife to poke her about it, to make fun of her, to belittle her, and let her, you know, feel the, the pain and the sting of being married and not having children. And Elkanah realizes this. He realizes in verse 4 or 5 that she is distraught. Let's read that. And it says that when the time... <clears throat> And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave Benaiah his wife and all her sons and all her daughters portions. I'm going to stop right there for just a moment. So when it came time for the family to be together, he would divide up portions. He would give them monetary things. He would give them portions of a meal. He would give them things. And as he began to divide out the portions to his family, he would take Benaiah and all of her children, sons and daughters, we read there in the passage, and don't say how many, but we know that there was plural, there was more than one. And as we begin to <coughs> see this, we begin to see that he began to give out the portions to them. And then as we get down into verse 5, he says this, but unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion. For he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. So as we see this, we see that Elkanah begin to feel her pain. He begin to see her hurt. He begin to, to notice the, the distraught and, the, and the, felt the feeling of unworthiness and the feeling of, 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 of this distraught in her heart. And he's going to make things better. He takes an the and, and, and really, if you begin to look at him, he, he's trying to do all that he can do. But bless his heart, he's just not doing a very good job. And he's a typical guy. And as we begin to see this, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But he begins to give to her things that he thinks is going to make it better. He begins to give her a worthy portion, or a double portion, more so than what he's given to Nye to prove his love, to prove his, her worthiness, and trying to help her feelings, trying to lift her up. So he gives her a, a larger portion. And then as we kind of come down to, to verse 8, he comes to console her. Let's read that. Then said Elkanah her husband to Hannah, to her. Let me read that again. Then said Elkanah her husband to her, Hannah, Why weepest thou? Well, why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I am not I better to thee than ten sons? So now he's came and he's brought her an extra portion of of the monetary things in life. He's brought her an extra portion of the of the food and, and the drink and, and everything that, that he's hoping is going to console.
console her and make her feel better. And he's noticed that she's not eating. He's noticed that she's not drinking. She's just kind of sitting over here in the corner. She's kind of, you know, removed herself from everyone else. And he comes to console her. And he comes to bring, to say some words that's hoping that's going to, that's going to fill her heart with, with, with some, some words and her, some value in her life and hope to lift her spirit. And as he begins to say this in, in verse 8, bless his heart, he's just a guy. But he says this. He says to her, why do you, why do you, why do you eat not? And why does the heart grieve? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So essentially what he's saying to her is I don't understand why you're not eating. I don't understand why you're not why, why you're not drinking. I don't understand why you have reclosed yourself and removed yourself and <clears throat> marginalized yourself over here in the corner so much. He said, she said, he looks at her and says, am I not better than you than ten sons? Basically what he's saying, he said, you've got me. You should have everything that you need. For 26 years, I've been trying to tell pain to You've got me. She's in the nursery, so I can, I can, I can say that. Y'all, she probably listened to me. Y'all want to tell her? No, I'm kidding. I'm just, 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 you know, here he is. He, he's just, he's so insensitive. He's so, he, he's to a point, he's just like, just trying to grasp the straw, trying to make things better. And he says, then you've got me. He said, what more do you need? Am I not better than you than ten sons? Well, that didn't, that didn't teach you. That didn't make it better. That didn't change the fact. That didn't lift the spirit. Matter of fact, it probably tore the, the scab off the wound. So as we begin to see that, He's really insensitive. She's had enough at this point. I mean, I think if we get into verse 9, we begin to see that she's literally had enough. And, and she's, you know, she's somewhere that she really don't want to be. She's somewhere that she knew that she was going to have to come and be there and be a part of and go through the motions and hopefully get through this this uh, this time of offering time. And this really should be a joyful time. This should be a time of offering of sacrifice. This should be a time, it's kind of like um, it would be, it would be similar, similar maybe to our Lord of Supper. It would be a time of celebration and thanking the Lord for what he had done and bringing an offering. And not only that, but it would be it, it would be a time of praise. It would be a time of worship. And, and, and it should be a time that they should have a, a good time together as a family. But this was not so for him. This was not so for her at all. It was not a joyful time. It was not a time that she could enjoy the worship that was set forth. So she has to watch Benign and Glow with her children and Benign and Pokes fun at her and Elkin, though he's so insensitive about the matter and trying to make things better and just really makes things worse. And, and really, she's a wit's end. She don't know what to do. But she comes up to a, comes up with a conclusion. So what did she do? Well, that's a good question. Let's look at verse 9 from 11, and we'll look at what she really did. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten the child up, and after they had drunk. Now Eli, the priest, sat upon the seat by close to the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thy handmaid, but will give unto me thy handmaid a man child, that I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. So she took her array of emotions. Now understand she's got a sack full of them. She's got a bunch of emotions of, of, of worthiness and of, of, of low self-esteem, and she's got all these emotions just bummed up inside her. And she brings them to the Lord. And we begin to, to see this. And she takes uh, all of this unwantedness, this unlove, this insecurity, and she just pours it out before the Lord. And, and, and you know, she's, she prays specific here. She was very specific in her, in her prayer. She said, if you will give me a man child or a male child, she was specific. She even gave a Nazarite vow. We know that Samson and Jesus, there's examples in the Bible of Nazarite vows that they were not to cut their hair, they're not to have strong traits, not to have dead things, lots of different things there that they were not to do. But this was to set them apart. And she said, I will do this. I will set him apart if you will bless me with a male child. So if, if we see this in verse 12 and 13, she really begins to, to pour her heart out 
When it said it came, it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart only and her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. And therefore Eli thought that she had been drunk. So if, if we was to see Hannah, if we was in that crowd that night, <clears throat> and we saw Hannah come out from behind this tabernacle here, wherever she came from, and here's Eli sitting on the corner of the tabernacle here. And as we begin to look at this situation, we would look at Hannah, this would really be, she's praying, but to us, this would be some ugly praying. And you say, what do you mean ugly praying? Is there such a thing as ugly praying? I, I don't, I'm not necessarily thinking in a sense of ugliness like we think of it, but it would be very undignified. It would be very different than what we're accustomed to. It would be very different than the way we pray so many times. And you say, well, what would be so different about it? If we look at this passage of Scripture, we begin to see that Eli, it was different than him. Because Eli thought that she was drunk. He said he marked her mouth. He began to watch her. He was paying attention to what she was doing. And he had gotten to the point that she started praying. And she was praying and asking God for all these things. And she just run out of words. And you know, I, I think about a passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 8. It talks about sometimes we don't even know how to pray. And when we get to the point that we don't know how to pray, all we do is we just we just kind of come to the end of ourselves and the Holy Spirit takes over and it gives us utterances of prayers that you know, we don't even know what we're saying. We can't even pray this because it's God, the Holy Spirit, praying for us and we give God permission to pray for us. Now here's the thing about that. That's some serious prayer. That's some undignified prayer because when we, when we pray, we have control over what we say. We have control over what we ask God for. We have control over what we're going to, what we're going to bow to God. We have control over that. But the Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace. And as we begin to look at that word boldly, what does that mean? That means we come to the throne of grace with great expectations, knowing beyond a shadow of doubt that no matter how many sackfuls of emotions that we lay on this altar, that we got a God that's big enough to meet us at our point of need and big enough to help us to overcome and bring a turnaround in our life. That's what it means to come boldly to the throne of grace. And this is where Hannah's at. Hannah's at a point in her life where she is, she is sick and tired of being sick and tired. She's sick and tired of feeling unworthy. She's sick and tired of the enemy poking at her every day. And she's come to a place in her life and she said, I know that I serve a God that's bigger than that. I know that I serve a God that's bigger than the enemy. I know I serve a God that's bigger than any want or need that's in my life. And I'm going to pour it out before the Lord and I'm going to believe him. And all of a sudden she just runs out of words. And here she is. She's just kind of undignified in the prayer, all sloppy and messy and just kind of messed up in the prayer. And all of a sudden, Eli looks at her and he says, look, he said, you need to get off the wine. You don't have too much to drink. And she said, don't consider me a woman of a while. I'm not, I'm not having wine or strong drink. She said, but I got a burden in my heart. She said, I got a burden in my heart and I got to bring to the Lord. She said, I got a situation that only, that only God can fix. She said, you just sit over there and you do your priestly duty, but I got to get in touch with God. I got to, man, I got to find God in this situation. I got to give it to Him. Now, as we begin to, as we begin to look at that and understand that she had come to a place in her life where she knew it was bigger than Eli. She knew it was bigger than her husband. She knew it was bigger than anything that she could possibly do. Now, let's just kind of look at this. Let's look at Hannah. Let's see if we can get a really dissect her situation here. Here she is. She's come undignified. And if she's come undignified, kind of like David bringing that off to the covenant back, he's, to, he's taking off everything that, that is significant of his authority and his role. And he's taking off this. And, and, and y'all remember that story when he went and got that, <clears throat> that Ark of the Covenant after, after the Philistines had taken it from, from, uh, from Eli that bus there. <clears throat> and it was at the house of Obed Edom. And, and David said, I'm going to take it back to Jerusalem. And then he put it on, on a new car. And we know that story got up on top of the consecration floor. And the Levites were the only ones supposed to be touching that ark. And oh, one of them who touched that thing to steady it when it, one of those oxen stumbled there. And, and God struck us down on the top of the mountain up there. And as we begin to see that, we understand that David was really distraught. He said, how would the ark going to come back to the nation of Israel? How would it get back to Jerusalem? 
And God told him the plan. He said, you get your Levites and you carry it like you're supposed to be carried. But he said, you sacrifice. And David would begin to sacrifice. And he began to pray. And he began to sacrifice. And he began to pray. And he would six faces. And he would pray. And he would sacrifice. This is some real prayer. This is some real worship. This is some real getting in touch with God. And, and, and finally, David just comes to the point that he took his robe off. And he's a king. Kings didn't take your robe off. But he took it off and he laid it to the side. He was down to his linen undergarment there, the ephod, linen ephod. And as he began to, he began to worship the Lord, he began to, he began to pray. And, and then when he got home, he was excited about being able to get there. And, and Michael saw the wife that he wanted to battle when he killed Goliath there. She said, you look really kingly out there today, dancing. Dancing before the, before the, um, before the congregation. And you done took your robe off, you down to your, to your linen ephod. He said, listen, honey, I wasn't dancing for you. I wasn't dancing for them. I wasn't dancing for anybody but the Lord. He said, I wasn't paying attention to what was going on. He said, I was in touch with God. And as we began to see this, as Hannah was, was much like that. She didn't care what people thought. She didn't care what they were saying. She didn't care what, they, what, they, what it looked like. She was to the point that she said, I got to get in touch with God. I got to get, I have to get up dignified in this. If it looks, if it looks totally out of sort, that's okay. And you say, well, you know, I can't do that, preacher. I, I can't just let my emotions out like that. There's probably a whole lot of truth to that. Because when we come to pray, we've got one of these little fancy, rehearsed, decided prayers. Oh, God, I need you to fix my problem. Thank you, Lord. Fix this for me. And you say, well, well you know, that surely the Lord hears that prayer. I believe he does. But I believe if we really want to move God, sometimes we've got to get serious with God. You say, well, well preacher, I, I can't really become too identified. <laughs> Sometimes I have a hard time believing that. We can get undignified when we talk to each other. We can, we, we can pour out our emotions when we talk to each other. We can let each other know how we feel about things and how, what's going on in our life. A lot of people don't have a lot of hard time getting, getting undignified on social media. They can pull, they can put it out there. They can unload their emotions out there, but when it comes to talking to God, <coughs> Well, we keep it all on the inside. We just real friend and we real proper. You know what? When God, when God sees that and God looks at our heart, He says, you know, you got some of that mess out of there. He said, I fill you up with some good stuff. He said, but you got to get rid of some stuff before I can fill you up. If you'll get all that, get those emotions out of there and all of that, all of that unworthiness and all of that stuff that you've been carrying around for all of this time, you just lay it out here before me. You can trade all that in for the joy of the Lord. You can trade all that in for something that will help you along the way. And this is where Hannah passed. She said, I'm just going to load some stuff this morning. She said, I'm just going to get rid of this stuff. She said, I've carried it as long as I can carry it. And she said, I'm fixing to pray and I'm fixing to seek God. And if I need to get ugly when I'm praying, if, 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 hey, if my mascara runs, that's okay. If my hair gets a little, little untangled, that's okay. But I'm going to pray and I'm going to seek God. I'm going to get real with God. And we begin to see this. With, uh, Eli took notice of this. And I think as we begin to, begin to see that as she brought that, <clears throat> those emotions there, as she brought it all there, I want you to notice what happened in verse 17 and verse 18. Let's read this. It said, then Eli, he saw her and he paid attention. And noticed, well, let me back up to, to verse 16 really quickly. And that's, that's that flew in on the conversation that she had with him. She said, don't count me to be a handmaid or for a daughter of Belial. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken to her too. She said, I'm not drunk, Eli, but I've got an issue. i got a problem. And notice in verse 17, then Eli took notice of this. Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel will grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And let thy hand may find grace in thy sight, so that the, so the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. So if we notice what happened there, Eli speaks to her and says, Go in peace. And then as we begin to see this, we begin to see that her countenance changed. Her appearance changed. She was no longer sad. She was no longer distraught. She was no longer the way that she was. So what happened there? Did her situation change to change her appearance? No. So many times our countenance don't change. Our, our appearance don't change. Our 
our business don't change until we get the blessing that, that we're praying for, until we get what God is, the full blessing of what God wants to do here. Sometimes we sit in the mother room, and we sit in the in our resolve, and we sit in our in our situation, and we sit in, in agony sometimes. But as we begin to look at this passage of Scripture, we begin to see that when she began to pray, all of a sudden, when Eli spoke peace to her situation, he remember, he's the mediator between her and God. Now, it was like God spoke through Eli. Now, Eli, bless his heart, he, he let them boys do some crazy stuff there. He, he let them just ruin the tabernacle, and we know that God's about to fix all that. <coughs> if you read over verse 4, and he took the boys out, and Eli died. And, but anyway... Undoubtedly, there was still a little bit of spirit in the old man. Because he, he spoke to her, and it wasn't just him speaking, it was a word from God. It was a word that comes straight from the throne room of God, and he spoke peace into her situation. Now, as we begin to understand that, we don't see a woman that humbled herself before the Lord and prayed for a child. She didn't get up ready at church. She didn't get pregnant. She didn't get up pregnant with conceived in her womb. That comes later. But as we begin to see this, when she began to humble herself before the Lord, she did get up. And she could see something not in her womb, but she could see something in her spirit that was going to make a difference in her life. She could see peace that surpassed all understanding. And she didn't know how God was going to work it out, but she knew that God heard her prayer and she knew God was going to work it out. That's I've been there. Uh, maybe you have to. Uh, there's times I pray about stuff and I don't know how it's going to work out, but all of a sudden you get a peace that just overshadows you. You know it didn't come from anything but God, and all of a sudden you've got this peace. It's, it's just kind of like God saying, I'm not going to tell you exactly how I'm going to fix it, but just know I've heard your prayer. And just know I'm, in, I'm working on it. Just know that I'm going to give you peace to be able to continue on. You don't give up praying. You continue to pray. And I'm going to give you peace to know that I heard your prayer. And this is where she's at. She got the peace of God to fill her heart after she laid all this other stuff, all this other emotions, and all this other baggage at the throne of God in the tabernacle there. And she laid it all out. And all of a sudden, God filled her with the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Her spirit had changed. She conceived in her spirit that God was in control. Now, as we begin to look at it, we begin to see that she began to, she began to do that. And she had this that God was working. She knew that God was working. But in order for that to happen, she needed to leave some stuff. She needed to make room for that peace, for that spirit of God. And I think if we begin to look at that this morning, that's, where, that's just kind of where it gets real to us. So we just had to ask ourselves the question, how long are we going to carry this? How long are we going to tote this around? How long are we going to, how long are we going to let this just, just continue to, to fester up on the inside and weigh us down and beat us up? And how long are we going to let the enemy poke on us? You know the sad thing about it? The enemy, what he was telling her, or what Benaiah was making fun of her, was the truth. It was not a lie. She was buried. She didn't have, she did not have a child. She was not pregnant. She didn't, she didn't have any children. But as we begin to look at that, that didn't make her any less significant in the eyes of God. That didn't make her any less valuable in the kingdom of God. And as we begin to understand that, sometimes what the enemy says to us is, yeah, we are unworthy. And as he speaks that into our ear this morning, in and of ourselves, yes, we are all unworthy. But what we need to do is put our foot down and say, that's exactly right, Satan. In and of myself, I am unworthy. But praise be to God, my worthiness don't come from, from being things of the world or, or what I can acquire or what I can do or anything that I can that I can that I can add to my life, my worthiness. I'm made worthy by the work of the cross. I'm made worthy by what Jesus Christ did on the cross at Calvary. And through his blood I have been made worthy to be a child of the King. And as we begin to understand this, so many times what Satan may speak to us, it may be true. But we got to understand too that God did God didn't send his son Jesus to die that we can live a, a defeated life. He sent his son Jesus to die that we can have a life, uh, they live a life full of abundance, of hope, of, of mercy and grace. And as we begin to see that, we begin to understand that you know, when, we, when we get all of these emotions, we trade them in. We trade them in for the joy of the Lord. And this is exactly what she did. And notice this. As we see that it wasn't true, 
And we see that we are made worthy by <clears throat> the blood of the Lamb. In verse, <clears throat> verse 20, I want you to finish this story up really quickly. Y'all come and give us some invitation. Yeah, let's move to read verse 19. And they rose up. They rose up in the morning early. And they worshiped before the Lord. You know, that day they were worship. Whole time she'd been there. Because all she could do was wallow in the emotions that was running rampant in her mind. Well, all of a sudden she got up the next morning and she began to worship the Lord. She felt like the weight had been lifted off of her. She felt like that the, that the cares of the world had been had come off of her. And you know what? <clears throat> they had. Because you know where they were at? She, tried, she put them at the, at the throne of God. She laid them at the feet of Jesus. And she said, honey, I'm not carrying these anymore. And as we begin to understand that, we begin to see that, that she worshiped. And as we get on in verse 20, <clears throat> The last part of verse 19 says, The Lord remembered her, and wherefore it came to pass when the time was come after Hannah conceived that she bare a son, and she called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. So many times, you know, we don't understand what God's doing in our lives. We don't understand why, why God is doing what he's doing. We don't understand why God's waiting. We don't understand why, why we're having to go through the the, the shame and the ridicule that we don't understand why we have to have to try to live this Christian life and everybody else seems to be prospering and grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. And we don't understand why it looks to us as if it is. <clears throat> but understand this. We read this story. If you read the rest of this story out, God had a plan for Hannah's life. God had a plan that she didn't know about. Because you see, Eli done got old and he done let their voice corrupt the temple. And they needed a new, a new priest and a new prophet. They needed a fresh word from God. And sometimes I think if we look at our world, we look at our situation, and we look at it, 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 what's going on around us, and we say, well, you know, God's done for God about us. Our nation's gone too far to be able to come back, huh? Don't ever believe that. Because sometimes God will just put somebody in power. Sometimes he'll call a Gideon or a Moses out. Sometimes he'll call a Joshua out. Or sometimes he'll create somebody. He'll conceive them in the womb. Like he's about to do in heaven's womb. He's about to conceive him a prophet in the womb. And he, is he going to call his name Samuel? And he's going to be the next leader there. He's going to be the next prophet. And as we begin to see this, we begin to see look back many thousand years ago. We saw a world that was in trouble with no hope and no help. But all of a sudden God says, I got this. He said, I'm not going to just plug me somebody that's already in existence out. He said, I'm going to conceive in the womb of a virgin girl. I'm going to conceive my son. And I'm going to put him there. And he's going to come. And he's going to be the help. And he's going to be the hope of the world. And he's going to Tell them he's going to bring salvation full and free. But not only that, he's going to bring life and life more abundantly to anybody who will trust him and believe him. And I believe as we look at this passage of Scripture this morning, I believe there's hope. I believe there's a turnaround in this passage of Scripture. I believe there's a turnaround for Hannah. I believe there's a turnaround for the nation of Israel. And I think if we let this kind of trickle right on down to the day and age that we live in this morning, I don't know how you came. I don't know what you came with. You may be full of trouble and strife and heartache and all kinds of emotions. But I believe that this with all my heart, that the work of the cross is significant. That Jesus shed enough blood on the cross of Calvary that not only can we have salvation full and free, but that He can He by His stripes we are healed. And I believe if we trust Him that He can train our, our insecurities and our, our, our unworthiness and all the things that we carry around with us, I believe beyond the shadow of doubt, the shadow of doubt, if we trust Him, we can trade it in this morning for the joy of the Lord. I believe that with all my heart. But sometimes we got to get serious. Sometimes we just got to give up some things and say, God, I'm coming. I'm going to lay it in this altar this morning. <coughs> I'm not picking it back up. I'm going to trade it all in. I'm going to walk out of here with the joy of the Lord this morning. I don't care what people say. I don't care what they think. I'm not going to worry about that. If I need to get undignified, if I need to pray for, for, for like I've never prayed before, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to touch the throne room of God. I'm coming boldly to the throne of grace. I'm coming believing that I serve a God bigger than any woman needs that I can lay at this altar this morning. 
I don't know where you're at. If you're here this morning, you never get your life. Lord, what a wonderful day it's been. So trust the Lord as your uh, Savior this morning. Trust Jesus and work on the cross. If you're here, you're just tired of carrying Would you just come and train it this morning? Would you just come and say, God, I'm going to give it to you. God, I'm going to get real with you. I'm going to get serious with you. God, I'm going to make some room in my heart for the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And I believe we serve a God this morning that will, that will conceive in your spirit and give you that peace that you stand in need. And I believe that he gives you that peace you stand in need of. I believe not only that, he'll answer your prayer according to his will and his purpose. Would you trust him this morning? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we might be able to look for you, the offer of the of our faith. God, we know that we can come boldly to the throne of God. And God, as we come boldly this morning, I pray that you give the ones that are here. If there's someone here that's struggling this morning, I pray you'll give them courage and boldness to step out and meet you at that point of need in their life. God, I pray that, that it not be just a <clears throat> just a simple recited prayer. God, that they would just bring all of their emotions. Just bring it all. Just get real with you. And just lay it before your feet this morning. And God, if there's one here that never, never embraced you as Lord and Savior, what a wonderful day. Would you meet them at their point of need? Let them trade all of their sins, all their struggles, all their strife for salvation full and free. God, we thank you this morning. We love you and we praise you. Yes, these things in Jesus' name.